Welcome to the Trauma Survivorhood Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah, a certified trauma recovery coach with Full Circle Wellspring. You are listening to Between the Seasons. This is a bonus content series while we gear up to season two when our regular format will return. Each bonus episode is a very special interview. We've got authors, creators, founders, community advocates, trauma survivors, and all brand new friends of mine. Please enjoy. All right. Welcome back to Trauma Survivorhood Podcast. I am your host, Sarah. I am here today with Alicia Garrison and Claire Higgins. They are from the Hope Works organization. It was established in 1994. It's a grassroots organization located in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. It's grown to meet the ever-changing needs of the community by providing no-cost peer support services. So this organization started HopeWorks got off the ground and their original team used their own lived experiences to interview other individuals receiving mental health services in the county and the core value of creating the capacity for people with these lived experiences to lead HopeWorks. This is the mission and work that integrates into every level of the organization. It's driven its growth. So HopeWorks employees who identify with their own mental health journey use these lived experiences to lift the voices of and walk alongside others in their journey and advocate for better services, support, and mental health all across their county. So today with us, we have Claire Higgins. She is the program director for the family and youth programs at HopeWorks. She graduated from University of Notre Dame. Her and her husband have a collection of 33 years of marriage. Oh my goodness. They have eight children, six biological and two adopted from Eastern Europe. And raising her adopted adopted children, they she recognized that there were significant trauma narratives along with physical and behavioral health challenges with her children. This fueled her passion for helping others to navigate the child serving systems in ways that they could feel safe and seen and heard. So she's been involved in peer work for over 17 years. She's trained in several signature programs with NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And she's achieved the highest level of trauma-informed care certification through Lakeside Global. She's involved in multiple state and county initiatives. She works with groups that aim at improving youth and family experiences across all of the county. Um, And then we have with us Alicia Garrison. She's the proud mother of three children, 14, nine, and seven. Uh, Her family started in 2012 when she and her husband began their journey as foster parents, uh, which led them to becoming adoptive parents in 2014 and 2016. They quickly grew from a family of two to a family of five within a two-year span. They were thrown into a world of mental and behavioral health for, for all of the children. So Alicia has worked tirelessly to support her children in multiple child serving systems. She spent countless hours researching and navigating the systems to try to find the best resources for these children. She acknowledges that it's been a really rough road, but she would not change it for anything. She's worked in the field of early childhood education for most of her life and made a clear career change when the pandemic hit, as a lot of us did, right? She brings her experience in childhood education to her current role, along with a passion for serving others with a trauma-informed lens, so important. She's really meeting people where they're at. She firmly believes that no one should ever be alone in their journey. And now she's working as a peer support partner so she can help families in their time of need. Ladies, thank you so much for your work. This organization is really, really phenomenal and spectacular. Um, I'm going to link everything in the bio, guys, of where this organization is and how you can find services uh, for yourself. But advocacy is so important for trauma and mental health. So welcome. Thank you for being here. I love your journeys. I love that you both started as parents working to help your own children in mental health and then then to take your stories and to commit yourself to the, to this role, right. Within hope works that this is a thing you're going to now do for other people, which I absolutely love. So, um, can you tell me a little bit about, and I know you guys are in, um, the, the youth and the transitional, um, programs within hope works, but the, what is this, what does hope works look like on like a daily basis? Like there's so many different outreaches community. They're doing service. They're making sure, you know, how they can help. They're doing advocacy work within the, um, within the, the city council and within, um, you know, the, the actual powers that be right. They're actually making changes. So how is this organization working on a regular basis? Like, what does this look like? 
behind the I scenes. can speak to the organizational structure and then I'll let Alicia just tell a little bit about like a day in the life of sort of a family yeah. peer. Yes. Uh, so we have six different programs at our organization. Um, our entire organization is peer led. Everyone in the organization identifies either as someone with their own lived experience in the mental health system or someone who is a parent of um, and is raising children with mental health uh, conditions or concerns. Um, so that really sets us apart from a lot of other organizations. We do not have any clinical oversight. So everything we do is based on peer support um, and walking with others through their own personal journeys. So every, every different business line that we have, that's the primary focus. So we have adult advocacy programs and then youth advocacy programs, both of which are either parents with their live, own lived experience supporting other parents who are going through, or parents with lived experience raising children supporting other parents who are raising children with um, some behavioral health struggles, or adults who've had their own journey who then support other adults. Um, and what that looks like can be different from day to day, right? It, it's whatever that particular individual needs support with, we have the flexibility to be able to provide that support. We don't have a prescribed number of units that we have to spend with each family or adult. Um, and it's really based on what their own goals are and their own needs. Those are our advocacy programs. We also have an adult and a youth survey program. Um, and what and those are, again, people with their own lived experience who are talking to folks who are receiving services and doing satisfaction surveys. Um, it's a state mandated program, okay. but we really, really focus on using folks with lived experience to do those surveys so that they can actually relate to the people that they're surveying. And then those surveys are conducted on all different programs um, through the public health system, um, so medical assistance. And the goal of doing those surveys is really to highlight family, youth, and adult voice within the systems and implement changes within the system. Um, I can give just a really good example. Our, we did a mobile crisis survey um, for families and, and youth. And one of the things that the families identified would have been helpful, uh, the way the mobile crisis system works in our county is that if uh, someone has an issue, the, the teams can actually come to the home, but they come to the home and typically serve the child or the adult who is struggling. Okay. And what was identified from that survey was that there's the support systems around them, like their parents or other loved ones in the home, didn't feel adequately supported during that crisis. They felt like mm -hmm. their loved one was supported, but they were still experiencing trauma from having to go through the situation. And it would be helpful for them to have someone to connect with during that crisis as well. So we were able to secure grant funding to provide 24 seven support, peer support in those crisis situations as well. So if the mobile crisis team went out and was doing clinical work with a child, they could loop a family in, a, a family peer in to talk to the parents at the same time, no matter what time of day or night it was. Wow. Um, and that all came from the survey. So we wouldn't have known that that was a need had we not also had our survey program. Wow. Um, and we have a, I know it's, it's amazing. And it's really, it's really creating services that families and adults identify would be helpful to them. I mean, we want to provide help that helps and that's our main goal. Yeah. Um, uh, when, you're, also, when you're saying about the mobile thing, I'm thinking about when a crisis happens in the home, DCYF comes in if there was a child involved at all, right? But then if a crisis happens with the child, there's no DCYF that comes in for the adults that were in the home. Like, that's what I'm thinking. Like, this is like a, a, a flip of that. That's amazing because you're experiencing the trauma yourself, even if now the child just got swooped up and got all the cares and off to the hospital or whatever, that would never happen if it was the other way. When the adult has something like that, DCYF comes in to go tend to the children and like start working with them. Uh, we have a um, like a crisis advocacy, uh, children's crisis advocacy that comes in to specifically trauma informed work with a child. Say there's a death in the home or after a domestic violence situation or something, right? But like we need that flip. We need that flip of if something is happening with the child, you know, the parent not having that that um, that support in there. So that's really that's really amazing. Yeah. 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 And that that's a situation where we we also really focus on 
doing what we do best, right? So what we do best is peer support. And when it comes to situations like with mobile crisis, before we started that pilot, we had multiple meetings with the mobile crisis team. We were cross-trained. They understood what we did. We understood what they did. We were trained in crisis de-escalation, even though that's not necessarily what we would be doing in this situation. So really also partnering with the community providers mm -hmm. in a way that is helpful for families and adults. And then the other program that we have is um, a community support program where we have an actual physical building where we have um, all kinds of it's almost like a thrift shop. We have furniture, we have household supplies, we have some clothing. Um, we've worked in partnership with other food pantries and other areas to also have um, uh, cooking facilities and food and washers and dryers so that we have a huge issue with um, people who are unhoused in our county, our county shelter closed. Um, oh, no. It was a, it's, it's a long story, <laughs> but anyway, the county shelter closed. And so there are many, many people who have nowhere to sleep at night. And HopeWorks was able to pivot with the support of other community partners to create a space where people can come in and make meals for themselves, take the meals out. We just got funding to have a shower in the building as well. Um, and folks can come in during the day. If you work in the market during the day, then you can exchange your time that you worked for items that you might need. Oh, um, we have you know, we have a furniture delivery program. We had, unfortunately, we had a tornado strike um, about a year ago and many people were in hur a hurricane as well and people were uh, lost their homes. So they've mm. been really supplying items for them. Uh, and this is all, everything we do is at no cost to families. It's no, we rely solely on county funding, grant funding and money from um, donations to do the work that we do. That is so. amazing. Wow. Unbelievable. The, um, the scope of the work is honestly quite impressive because usually there is a very, like a very specific niche that someone will work with. Right. So you might have like, um, you know, one, one whole nonprofit for like a domestic violence or sexual assault or, um, you know, child's um, mental health, you have one, you guys are like, you have your hands in so many different things that when a homeless shelter in your county closes, you guys are able to pick up a lot of the pieces there, which is really a really testament to the scope of the work that you guys are doing, which is, which is amazing. I love that. So Alicia, what does that look like in this, this family peer support? How does that, how does that look? So it is, I mean, it is so different every day. Um, and when you think you have your day planned out to like what in your mind you want to accomplish, somebody calls and there's a crisis and it completely gets derailed for the day. Um, most of, most of my day is finding resources for my families and just pretty much listening to them and supporting them in whatever capacity they may need. Um, sometimes it's just letting them vent. Um, letting them voice their anger and frustration and let them take it out on you instead of the providers or the IEP support team that they're angry at at the moment. Um, you know, we let them kind of take their frustration out on us so that it doesn't reflect, you know, essentially poorly because they don't want to, they don't want to be angry. They don't want to be frustrated. They don't want to be known as that parent who likes to cause the problems, but sometimes the squeaky wheel is the one who gets the stuff done. And we help them do that in a professional way. We help them prep for IEP meetings when they go into the schools. We look through the IEPs with them. We can help make them make suggestions for them to feel more confident going in to the meeting. Um, if it does go to due process or mediation, we support them through that whole process as well, walk them through what it will look like. Um, if they need resources for funding for summer camps, if they're behind on their bills because they've had to take time off because their child has been in the hospital or doing a partial program, we help them find funding for that. If they need school supplies, we help them find those resources. We really, we just try and cover all bases with our families. Um, and it's amazing once you start digging how many resources are out there. But as a parent who's working 40 hours a week while taking care of children who have special needs, you don't have the time to sit there and dig through and type in keywords for simple stuff. Um, 
you know, and for whatever reason right now, we're seeing a lot of eating disorder trends going on. And we've had to find a lot of eating disorder resources for our families. And unfortunately, a lot of those programs have gone to the wayside for whatever wow. reason. So we've, we've really been struggling finding adolescent programs, adults, wow. not so much, but adolescence has been a, a really big struggle. Wow. And then just help talking the parents through the wait lists for some of these organizations. We've had families who have sat in the ER for two weeks waiting for a bed to open up at a facility and just kind of keeping them positive and letting them know what hospitals to go to that they won't necessarily have to stay at with the child who will supervise their child while they're waiting for a bed. Um, and then we're, we're always doing outreach to different organizations so that they're aware of our services and letting them know that we're here to take referrals. Um, and I mean, it's, it's really so different every day, the phone rings and it could just tailspin and you might be on the phone for three hours talking to a parent who's in the middle of a crisis because their mental health services fell through or their child had their medication changed and they're experiencing really bad side effects. And it's, yeah. you know, just being there to support them in any way that you can. Yeah. The complexity of family-based trauma, whether it's the adult struggling or the child struggling, the complexity piles up so quickly. It is a ladder that you cannot stand on one rung for more than five seconds before it breaks. Like it is an ongoing upward uphill battle, right? Um, with a lot of back and forth and back and forth, you know, it's very zigzaggy. It's very much like a maze, a lot like most trauma recovery journeys, um, and to have someone walking beside you is amazing. Having someone walking beside you who actually knows what they're talking about, double amazing. And then someone who has been through it and can provide the resources. That's to me, like the missing link where you guys come in. So in your organization, if someone is, is actually working there as a, as a peer support, is everyone tra um, trained in trauma informed care, or is this something that's like part of their training or are they coming in with like, you know, um, outside certifications of trauma informed care? Is this just kind of a learned thing as they're, as they're going along? We are all required to take trauma informed care training. Um, we're all in, and there's there are so many in our state. They're wonderful resources. There's a um, a, a grant that they received to perpetuate, you know, this trauma informed care, um, and so they have the state offers a whole series of trainings, um, including like trauma informed peer support training and um, trauma around racism and diversity and all of these kinds of things. So we are all encouraged to take all of those state trainings. Um, there are also a bunch that are specific to each of our specific, you know, programs that we do. Um, and a number of us, I will, I will tell you that trauma training has changed my life. I started with this series um, in 2011, I started taking, uh, it's a, it's a really long, like a three-year se trauma series that you can take through Lakeside Global. Um, and it really changed the way I look at people. It changed the way I look at relationships. Um, it changed the way that I interact with others and what I think going into a situation with them. It changed how I speak to others about my children and about the people that we work with. Um, you know, we, we say all the time, it's really hard to take those trauma lenses off once you've put them on. Um, yeah. You can't not see it through a trauma lens. So uh, we are very, very dedicated to being very trauma informed and trauma aware. Um, and also, you know, I think one of the other things that's unique about us as opposed to just a good friend who might listen is the care that we take building relationships within the community and with providers. So for example, we, I worked with a family who um, had terrible IEP meetings all the time. And it was, I mean, to the point where the dad upended a table in the meeting one time because he was so frustrated. And once we were able to build that relationship with the family, the dad said to me, it's always a bad meeting. I go into that meeting every time. And I look up at that clock on the wall that's sitting in that room where I have that every time we go to the same room with the same clock. And I just was staring at the clock, waiting for the meeting to be over. And I said, what if we asked the school to have the meeting in a different room? And he said, can they do that? And the school was amenable. And the next time it wasn't so bad because he had, you know, your body remembers those bad experiences. Wow. And he 
he, every time he went in there, he went loaded for bear because he remembered those, those difficult experiences. So yeah. I think we work very, very hard with the providers in our area um, to, to let them know that we're there to support everyone in the room. We're there to really kind of like help lower the temperature. We don't work magic. I mean, we just sit with people in hard spaces and we, we can be that neutral party when they're very emotionally charged or sort of having a, a moment where they're remembering something that was difficult for them in the past. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. The trauma stewardship, right? That once you learn about trauma stewardship and you're like, this is really, this is a human condition. This is a human problem and there is a human fix to this, right? So if I can be part of it, if you guys can be part of it, and anyone really can, because just learning just those little tiny things, those little pieces of information about understanding how trauma works. And uh, Oprah always used to say, and her and Dr. Perry have their new book, you know, what happened to you. You don't, you know, you don't say what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. Like, where's that coming from? Are you okay? And the co-regulation is a big piece as a, as a trauma recovery coach. That's a lot of what we do co-regulating and teaching other people that it's okay to sit in a safe space right now. You're feeling kind of wild. We can calm you down. You're feeling a little depressed. Let's just bring you one little level up, right? That co-regulation is so important, especially in crisis. Right. But, um, but even just in the ongoing, it's chronic stress at this point, right? Because these are years long problems. This is not, we're not talking about acute traumas. We are talking about ongoing chronic stress and being in a system that is chronically overworked <laughs> and, and needing of some repair. I want to talk more about um, the advocacy works inside of HopeWorks, that, that program that you were talking about. Uh, the bio for this is that it assists individuals in resolving problems facilitates workshops on self-advocacy, so important, and participates on relevant committees and boards. The staff uses a team to approach to advocate resolution in order to develop the best outcome for the problems that they address and to provide learning opportunities. I love that because it's not just, okay, this time problem solved is, was there like a growth that now next time you'll have some just little keys, other little tools that you can use in your toolbox. Um, but to enhance each person's ability to speak for himself or herself in a way that fosters recovery. And I know you, you've chatted quite a bit about this, but the, the gap between, especially the client and their practitioner, I love what Alicia said, like sometimes they just need a vent because you also don't want to go into your practitioner and vent on them. Right. And then they're like, Oh, here they come again next week. Right. So I love that you allow that, that bridging the gap between those, what kind of results are we seeing like on the individual level? I definitely want to hit the community level, but just thinking on like individuals, what are we seeing as the impact? Are we seeing that there are more, are they able to kind of move through these programs, have this peer support using the education and kind of then launching themselves? Is there, is there like a, um, like an interdependence where they're kind of relying on you as things escalate, but when things are okay, are these really long-term clients? What's that individual impact like? I think it's different for each individual, but we have kind of a mantra that we say, and it's do with, do for, cheer on. Nobody comes to us when things are going well. So, you know, it's right. not like, it's not like we have a, a huge base of people who are saying, I'm really happy with this, <laughs> the way things are going. <laughs> um, so we start out really, really with a lot of support. And this is for the children's programs as well as the adult programs. Um, a lot of, you know, sometimes that even means calling the providers with them or for them to help them get an appointment, um, really helping to build their confidence that they can do it, really listening and spending many, many hours a lot of times with them. Yeah. Um, and then moving on to that sort of do with phase as opposed to doing for where it's kind of like, you know, they, they do become reliant. Some of them do become very reliant and we have to be careful about setting boundaries and making sure that they're, they're not becoming too dependent on us because that's not going to help them in the long run. Um, but it's really encouraging them to try some things on their own. It might be, you know, uh, not, not being, if you're not available for a meeting at the very beginning, we'll say maybe someone else can step into that meeting if we're not available for you. And then the next meeting we might say, let's prep ahead of time. And then you can check 
right back in afterwards and see how that went um, and giving them that little independence. And almost always they'll come out and say, gosh, it went a lot better than I thought it would, would go. And then we move on to the cheer on where we actually will say, you got this, you can do this on your own. And we might just be checking in with them every couple months. Sometimes we don't hear from them for a year. You know, it really depends on each individual. Um, and really on their own, you know, many times we'll have, we'll work with someone and things will go well. And then we might be their first to go to if things get bad again. And we're always happy. We also have that flexibility. You don't need to do a new intake to work with us. You don't need to get a new doctor's note, right? Just come back and we'll support you. And most times they just need that little check-in again, that little boost of confidence, um, and then they can do it on their own. I mean, our goal is really to put ourselves out of a job, right? Um, we want people to be yes. able to manage this on their own. Just like Claire said, it really, it goes in waves. I mean, when it's good, it's good. But then if there's issues going on, you know, it could escalate very quickly. And just having that flexibility of being available for the families or the individuals, I mean, it makes all the difference. You know, they can just call us up and, and lean on us when they need that support again. I love that. And without having to start fresh, I think that that's, that, that would be like a deterrent to people, right? If they're like, oh, I've got to start all the way over again, right? So um, I think that's a really helpful piece. Like, hey, I could just check in every once in a while. That's, that is, that's, that's really, really true. So now on the community level, um, just thinking, so we're working actually to implement change, right? Within your county, you are working at the official level. You're presenting these surveys, like you gave the example of the mobile crisis center, right? You're working with other organizations and with actual state and county officials. Where are we seeing this kind of implementation? Is it utilizing the surveys that's bringing in change or are like, is there bill proposals? Are there things that are on the voting deck that you guys are pushing for? Is it different services that you guys are, are reaching out to the community asking for more support? I mean, I love that you guys are involved with grants and stuff. Obviously the state and the federal level know you guys, right? If you're handing out um, grants and you're able to kind of make change in that way, but what's that community implement change like? <laughs> Again, it's really individual and it's really based on whatever the needs of our community in particular might be at the moment. Yeah. Um, personally, I can speak. So one of my children was in a residential treatment facility and um, we all know the trauma that happens anytime a child is taken out of the home, let alone put in a higher level of care. And she ended up being assaulted in the residential treatment facility. And so as a parent, you think about... Um, you think about you, you're sending your child somewhere to be safe, right? And then they end up getting, um, you know, sexually abused. And it's a, a really, really hard thing. Um, and so I made it a goal of mine to be involved in safety and higher levels of congregate care, right? And I think not safety, not just um, advocating for change, but also helping parents to understand what the expectations are and what to look out for when their child is in congregate care, that kind of thing. But I have been involved now for about six years in uh, changing the regulations for the um, residential treatment facilities in Pennsylvania for children. And part of that work is from my own personal experience, but also bringing the voices of everyone that we have served to those committees. So I would say that in terms of us being able to make a change, the main way that we can make a change is by bringing those collective voices, encouraging other people to share their voices and reduce that stigma about talking about it. You know, nobody, nobody, it's really hard to talk about when things are not going well with yourself. You know, we live in a society where on social media, everybody's like, today was great. And this went well and everything's perfect. And then you come in and say like, oh my gosh, my, you know, my child doesn't, you know, doesn't want to live in the house anymore and is really aggressive and just caused $10,000 worth of damage to my home. And then people, it's really hard to say that. It's really hard to live that. And it's really hard to say that. But the more that we can help others speak about it safely in a way that is okay for them, uh, the more people listen. And so we do that at the local level. We do that at the state level. We do that at the federal level. Uh, we are 
constantly lobbying for more um, peer support services, for better pay for peer support services. Uh, because lived experience is the main requirement for peer support, sometimes it's not regarded as an equal service and the pay rates are significantly lower than for some other clinical services. Uh, so a lot of people can't make a living wage doing this work, um, which is really hard because it's really important work. As a whole, you're speaking up for, for everyone behind you, right? So you're using that voice by carrying, like, you, I love how you said that you're carrying these other voices with you as you go and you're advocating for them just on a, not even on this personal level, but inside of the community, inside of our country, inside of the state. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for, for that. You guys with, with both of your stories, ladies, um, I always like to ask resources for yourself, um, in your own mental health journey in your own uh, trauma with your own children and, and their own stories and journeys, what were some of the most helpful resources internally, externally, or both that was really helpful in supporting you guys in your healing journeys? I think for me, um, one of the organizations that my daughter received therapy at also provided therapy for the caregivers as well. And just being able, while she was in her sessions, I was then pulled out and spoken to and was allowed to kind of unload my frustrations and just have them sit there and listen to me vent mm -hmm. while she was in there. Because I mean, that was really my only free time was while she was occupied, my other two were at a babysitter and then I could get the care that I needed. Um, yeah. And just remembering that self-care, um, I'm really bad at it. I'm not. I'm not going to lie. I am horrible at self-care. Yeah. I don't know how to relax. I don't know how to stop. Yeah. Um, so I tend to over schedule myself and overload myself. Um, and I find for me, that's my self-care is staying busy and having stuff to focus on and organizing. And I love fundraising. So I do a lot of fundraising for my kids' sporting teams and their extracurricular activities just to make sure that they're getting the help that they need to. I just love to help. I don't know. I'm strange. It's just one of those things. You are but, your helper. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're I like helper. to help and I like to fix. Um, but just remembering that self-care, you know, I do love to read. So at the end of my day, I do curl up in bed with a good book. Usually I fall asleep like two chapters in, but I do love to read and I love my retail therapy as well, yes. which isn't, isn't always healthy, but I do love my shopping. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, that's okay. Right. Because my, my coach and me wants to jump in and be like, be like, that's great though, because if it's something that you're using as a coping skill, that's really helpful for you, for you in the moment. And then when you start to recognize it's maybe not so healthy, you go back to doing something different. All right. Instead of going here, let's go for a walk instead and just kind of trick your brain up a little bit so it doesn't get too obsessed with it. But it certainly is a great resource, right? Because you have got to be out there anyways. You got to be buying stuff. You have children, you have a home, you have a family. So you got to be out there anyways. You might as well grab a few little things for yourself while you're there. So that is, especially when you don't do a lot of other self-care, right? Putting yourself first and saying, oh, you know, I might, I might like that is great. I love it. And the book reading is so helpful. That's great to kind of calm your mind at the end of a busy day. I tend to be on the um, higher energy spectrum level of life. Also more on the anxiety versus the depression kind of scale that we all seem to walk somewhere on. Right. And I will do, do and do and do until I crash. Right. So book reading. I love that. That's, that's really great. I am thrilled to hear that in your journey as a parent with a, a child who's struggling, they did dual therapy at the same time. That is a game changer. And I think every single clinic should adopt that right now. I'm saying it on this podcast. I'm TMing it right here, right now, because that I can only imagine how helpful that resource was, especially when you have no other time to do anything else, but you would be literally sitting in a waiting room, playing on your phone or reading a book. You might as well be working with, with a therapist and just venting, verbal ventilating and processing. I love that. I love that. Claire, what about yourself? What's some, what are some resources? So I think, I mean, similar to what Alicia said, I think for me, knowledge is power. So I, I found myself because I felt like I didn't have, have a lot of resources. So I was out there buying every single book on trauma and on adoption and reactive attachment. I was out there doing all the research I could buying workbooks for my children to work on really like filling myself up with information, which was is overwhelming, but is also helpful. But I specifically remember at one um, one 
facility where my child was being treated, I walked into the room and I was ready for a fight because every time you go somewhere as a parent, the first thing they do is tell you what you're doing wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was ready for a fight and I was ready to justify what had happened. And I was ready to explain why my children were doing what they were doing. And I walked into the room and he said, I, I already know you're a really, really good parent. And I said, what? And he said, I said, how, how do you know that? And he said, because you keep showing up every single yeah. time you keep coming back and you keep trying. And I was like, okay, you, you have my heart. What do you want? I'll tell you my whole life story. I, mm. you know, because I felt that, that he trusted me as a parent, there wasn't any judgment there. So my advice to others who are looking for support is find that person that, you know, it's not necessarily one service or one provider, but that person that believes you and hears you and validates you and gives you the space to speak without judgment, it will change the way you look at the system and the providers, knowing that you are, there are going to be a lot of hurdles and you're going to face a lot of people who are difficult, but if you can find one or two good people who really get it, yeah. Um, especially professionals who really get it and who can understand your concerns about medicating the child or who can understand your concerns of what that means for the other people in your household and how it's affecting them and address the entire family unit as opposed to just um, the one person who is struggling. It, that changed everything for me. Wow, that's beautiful. I think being seen and being heard, I think if, the, if a doctor had said that, I, I probably would have just balled up in a, in a puddle of tears at that point. Like that is so beautiful to be seen and heard, to be recognized for the work that you're doing, you know? So, oh my goodness. So powerful. Oh my goodness. I feel a little emotional. So beautiful ladies. Thank you so much. Your work is so important. I just want to recognize all of the, the work that you're doing within your community. And now you're reaching out to the entire country. And I have some, uh, some um, international listeners as well. So you're reaching out to the world, right? To let them know that you're giving people hope is what I'm hearing coming through here, because A, you've been through stuff and yet here you are, you know, and now you are able to facilitate advocacy, peer support programs that are available. Um, I'm going to have linked in the show notes a couple of options so that people can find these type of advocacy centers in their own area, um, wherever they might be. Um, and uh, anyone can can reach out to me, of course, and, and ask me specifics that I can always help them find that. Resourcing people is one of my favorite things. Um, you know, just giving them different tools in their toolbox. The more options that we have, the less crazy we feel. Because if we feel like we only have one option or two, and now we're judging between which one is the worst of the two, those are horrible options. So giving people lots and lots of options. I love that. Is there anything else that we should know? Anything I didn't ask, didn't cover that you ladies would like to share with us today? The only thing I would like to say is just as hard as it gets, just remember you are not alone. And there is always somebody out there going through something similar that what you're going through. And you just need to find that right group of people who will there to be be there to support you through this. And you are definitely not alone at all. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, Alicia. Claire. No, I just, I mean, we're so grateful for our ability to do this work and that the county really supports us. The majority of our funding does come through um, county reinvestment dollars. And, you know, it's always our hope that this can be available everywhere to everyone. Uh, it's just, it's not a very well-funded type of service um, throughout the country. So if you don't have access to something like this, you know, talk to other people, talk to some of those local resources that Sarah's going to provide. And if it, you feel it in your heart to donate to organizations that are working on peer support, um, you know, it's, it's a very, very underfunded and, you know, we, we work very, very hard because we're dedicated to this work, not because we're making good money at this work. Yes, um, yeah. We're committed to changing lives and it takes a lot of support to do that. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Absolutely. And HopeWorks is going to be, it's um, it's hopeworksinc.org and that's going to be posted in the, in the notes as well. So if anyone is in your area, I'm sure they are going to quickly fall in love with the work that you're doing. Um, and uh, we'll see if we can get some extra donations in for you ladies and the work that you guys are doing with HopeWorks. Thank you again for joining me. I really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
Thank you for listening to Trauma Survivorhood Between the Seasons bonus content. For more info and show notes, check out the episode guide below. Until next time, be well, survivors.